Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to this Datadog on Rust session. Uh, Datadog is a series of, uh, of webinars where we invite engineers here at Datadog working on Datadog itself, uh, on projects related to Datadog, to talk to us about particular technology they're using or a process they're following or something specific about the work they're doing. Uh, for any other episode that you may want to watch, you can go to our website, datadoc, uh, um, on .datadochq.com. Uh, you have the recordings for uh, all the previous episodes. And as soon as we finish this and we record this one that is already also being recorded, uh, you will be able to, to watch this one as well. Uh, some housekeeping items before we start. So the first thing is that we want to make this as interactive as possible. So feel free to use the chat window on your Zoom client to, to say hello, where are you coming from, why you're interested in Rust, uh, et cetera. And also we are going to leave uh, enough time at the very end for questions. So if you have any questions for the speakers, please do you use, instead of the chat window, use the Q&A button that you have on Zoom. Leave there your question and we will be able to answer those at the end. So you don't have to wait until the very end to ask the question, just put it there um, and we will cover those. But don't use the chat window for questions that you want to address to the speakers, because if not, it's going to be missed um, between all the chatter that may happen during the session. Good. Um, so in case you don't know, uh, Datadoc is a monitoring and analytics platform that helps uh, companies improve the observability of their infrastructure and, and applications. This is the, the thing that we're building. Um, my name is Ara Polida, I'm a technical evangelist here at Datadoc, and I'm also one of the co-hosts and co-organizers of this series, Datadoc On. So if you have any feedback about the series or you want to propose a topic that you want us to cover, uh, please feel free to, to reach out either through email or that's my Twitter handler. Um, any of those two uh, should, be, should be good to go. But today uh, to talk about Rust, uh, the important people are Brian and Duarte. Brian, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, so my name is Brian and I am a staff engineer here at Datadog. Uh, my background is in systems programming, um, particularly single machine performance, things like that. So um, that will that will color the material that I'll be presenting today. Good, uh, Duarte. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Duarte. I'm an engineer at Datadog working on the metrics index team where we are currently working on a recipe write of an existing service. Uh, my background is in low latency distributed systems, which is what I'm still focused on. Good. Um, so we usually start this episode by talking just a little bit about Datadog scale, um, because some of the things that we are going to be talking about, some of the decisions that we make while building Datadog, it's kind of related to, to that scale. Uh, so Datadog has more than uh, 70,000 customers. Um, and obviously we are a monitoring platform, so we are basically gathering tele telemetry from those customers and those adds up to millions of hosts that translate really into trillions of data points per day that uh, we need to process. So that's more or less the background, uh, but today we are going to be talking about uh, Rust. Um, some, if you've been following along Datadog on, or you're familiar with the work that Datadog is doing, uh, you may know that uh, Go is, is for backend is very important um, at Datadog, but more and more teams are starting to, to start using Rust for some particular services. And so today we are going to be talking about why, why Rust, and we are going to discuss a couple of those two applications that we are using Rust for. So to start, um, in case you're not familiar with Rust, um, Duarte, do you want to give us a little bit of overview of where Rust sits on the language landscape. Yeah, sure. Um, so Rust is a statically typed ahead of time compiled language, heavily focused on reliability and performance. And that makes it ideally suited for low latency systems. Now with Rust, you can also build programs that do not depend on a standard library. And because of that are unable to do heap allocations which also makes it ideal for uh, special purpose embedded systems, which have uh, significant constraints in terms of available resources. 
The languages that are traditionally used in these domains are C and C++, which uh, have some shortcomings, as I'm sure we're all aware. Um, the biggest of which are safety issues. Uh, for example, if you have an integer overflow in C or C++ applications, that can lead to an exploit, whereas uh, in safe Rust, um, they, they are forbidden. They also have some composability issues as it is hard to integrate third-party code with um, C and C++ applications. And that's because there exists no standard package manager in those languages, but also because uh, third-party libraries may manage memory or do threading in a way that's incompatible with the host application. So managed languages like Go or those running on JVM uh, solve some of the safety issues with C++, uh, namely memory safety. And they do this by providing automatic memory management, uh, which uh, exacts a uh, very significant runtime cost. And Rust uh, solves uh, memory safety as well as other safety issues like we'll see shortly without incurring that overhead. Uh, Rust also provides Cargo, which is a very nice package manager. Uh, so you'll see that Rust applications tend to have and more dependencies uh, than their C and C++ counterparts. Uh, and all, all of those dependencies compose uh, well. So the, the safety features of Rust mean that its programs are very stable in production, which already makes it a very attractive language. Add to that the fact that it has a very rich ecosystem with lots of open source uh, libraries, and that is, it is a very expressive language, uh, having features and mechanisms like generics and macros uh, with little to no runtime overhead. Um, so all of this means that Rust is extending to other domains like serverless computing, where uh, having an efficient language means a smaller bill and uh, web programming, web assembly, and now even the Linux kernel. Uh, so yeah, uh, Rust is becoming uh, very popular and prevalent. Good. Thanks. Uh, thanks for that overview. It's really very interesting to see that it's also becoming a language for for things like serverless that usually you you wouldn't expect. Um, so while while we were preparing this episode and both uh, Brian and Duarte were talking to me about Rust, uh, they they kind of agreed uh, that it's uh, not a simple language. That's like some of the things Duarte already explain on, on his overview. Uh, but the way that, that they were explaining to me um, that I thought was very interesting is that uh, all the languages, the complexity of, of writing programs in other languages are simpler on the coding phase and then move the complexity uh, to production. It's a little bit more difficult to run those programs. Uh, in Rust, uh, that spectrum of complexity between coding and production has shaped left a little bit to, to coding. It's a little bit uh, more difficult, more complex, or less simpler, let's say, uh, to write programs in Rust. But then uh, running those programs in production is going to be a little bit easier. Uh, so, Brian, do you want to explain why, why that, that's the case? Yeah. Yeah, so the, the, the basic bet that you're making with Rust is that its safety guarantees give you better programs overall. Um, those safety guarantees are done at compile time, and sort of the major safety guarantee that you get out of Rust is memory safety. Um, so memory safety is, uh, for those of you that have worked in high-level languages, um, memory safety is a, a, uh, a difficult thing to get right in systems programming languages. So they're sort of three broad approaches to memory management um, that I want to discuss. The, the first is sort of manual, which if you've done any C or very old school C++, um, you'll be familiar with that. That's where you malloc a piece of memory and then you are responsible for freeing it later. Uh, you are, or newing and then deleting. The, the upside to manual memory management is that it is very simple for the language implementation. Um, it is very direct, so you're interacting with the operating system kernel through syscalls, things like that, to get your memory generally, um, the or or through a malloc or an allocator that then does the syscalls. Um, the downside is it's very easy to screw that up. So every time you malloc a piece of memory, if you don't free it, that memory is just lost in the program, especially if you lose the pointer. So that's a memory leak. Uh, 
Um, the other potential issue that, that C runs into quite a bit is the, the double free problem where you have freed a piece of memory and then you try and reference that uh, memory, which the operating system has potentially filled in with garbage or maybe not, or maybe someone else's memory. So uh, it's a, a consistent source of bugs. So our field to try and move away from manual memory management because it is not memory safe, because you can do things that crash your program or cause security issues, things like that, um, started investing in garbage collectors. So a garbage collector is an abstraction where um, you, through generally programming language facilities, but sometimes not, um, don't directly allocate memory. You create a structure from the garbage collector. The garbage collector is then sort of responsible for tracking the use of that memory. Is it still live in the program? And freeing it when it uh, decides to reap memory. There are a lot of algorithms for doing this. The upside of garbage collection is that it is very ergonomic. It's very easy to, to, to deal with. Um, the downside is that now your language has to have a runtime or you have to include kind of a runtime in your, your program if you're doing lower level systems programming. Uh, and that runtime is not free. So it may or may not be slower depending on your use case, but it's not something that is necessarily free. Um, it also adds, except for some specialized algorithms, it adds non-determinism into your program. You don't know necessarily when garbage collection is going to happen. So if your program is very sort of latency sensitive or things like that, that, that non-determinism is undesirable. Um, more modern systems programming languages have started to include the concept of ownership. Um, so in C, you malloc, and then you, the programmer, are responsible for remembering and doing analysis in the program of where that memory is held and where it's used. What you're doing is a manual form of ownership tracking. So you're figuring out, is this piece of memory that you've allocated still live in the program? A garbage collector does ownership tracking uh, at runtime. It figures out if a piece of memory is still live, depending on how that's done, depends on the algorithm. The ownership model that Rust exposes uh, and C++ to a different degree um, is done at compile time. So the, the basic idea is that a variable in a program is uh, tied to a piece of memory. Uh, that variable in Rust is called the owner of that piece of memory. So the rules around ownership are that there can only be one owner at a time. So you have created a piece of memory through new, you've assigned it to a variable, and there is one place in your program that owns that memory. When that variable disappears, when it goes out of scope, that value is dropped. So automatically at compile time, Rust is able to tell if a piece of memory is still live or not. The, the important benefit of this is that you can do a couple of things with owned memory. You can move the memory through move semantics, which C++ also has. Uh, that allows you to say that another part of the programmer is responsible for keeping track of this piece of memory. And only one piece of the program can uh, be the owner at a time. The other thing that you can do is borrow. So you can take mutable or immutable borrows um, that allow you to read or interact with that piece of memory in a way that doesn't infer or doesn't imply ownership of it. Uh, the benefit of this is that now as a, a Rust programmer, it's possible for you to allocate a piece of memory, do really fancy things with it, and then be certain at compile time uh, that you never leak memory, you never double free uh, uh, memory. The downside <laughs> is that it takes a little while uh, to, to sort of convince the compiler in some cases um, to, to play ball with you, or rather to learn what the compiler's constraints are. But the upsides are pretty huge. So the, the other piece of um, safety that, that Rust sort of guarantees that is actually predicated on the, the memory safety rules is concurrency safety. So um, I, I goofed in my intro and forgot to mention that I work on the Vector Project. So the Vector Project is a, a very large concurrent, like internally concurrent piece of software. We are allocating memory, flinging it to another thread, 
Um, so if you've ever done sort of C or C++, you are aware that highly parallel and concurrent software is challenging uh, to get right. You get a lot of spooky action at a distance because keeping track of which thread owns what and is allowed to manipulate what um, is, is problematic, <laughs> to, to say the least. Because of the ownership and borrowing rules, the Rust compiler is actually able to determine at compile time if a piece of memory is allowed to be transferred between threads, if it's allowed to be modified between threads or read uh, in a way that gives you quite a bit of freedom in how you implement structures um, with, within the constraints of these safety rules. Um, so as an example, here's a, a, little, a, a little program. Um, the VEC V, so a, a VEC for those of you that don't do Rust as a continuously growing array, um, We've allocated a vector here. So we've done a heap allocation and stuffed three integers in it. And we've called that B. What we're trying to do is a couple of things. So we have the main thread, which happens to correspond to the main function. Uh, we are then spawning a subthread and trying to print the contents of, of V. We are also at the same time trying to drop uh, or deallocate V in the main thread. So there's a race here. There is a race between the subthread and uh, uh, trying to print and the main thread trying to deallocate. In, in a language with less strict rules, this would compile and then we would run it. It might work, it might crash, it might print garbage. Who knows? <laughs> it's, it depends on what the operating system scheduler does. It depends on how the memory allocator works. Um, Rust, on the other hand, when we compile this, dings us. So we get, a, we get a warning, or rather we get an error <laughs> that the vector v uh, outlives the current function, um, which means that the main thread might exit while the subthread, according to, to this analysis, is still live in some sense. And the memory would be deallocated because if you recall, when a, vector, or when a value goes out of scope, it gets deallocated. Um, Rust then suggests that we might try moving the ownership of the vector into the subthread. But if we do that, we still have the main thread that's trying to um, drop, which is an operation that you can only do if you own a piece of memory. So the program just generally will not function. So we'd have to figure out uh, something to do. Now, this is a, a uh, simplistic example, but in a program like Vector, um, where you have a lot of people working on it. Getting these types of rules right uh, without the help of the compiler is actually very challenging. Um, and we do see pretty regularly that we try and do unsafe things uh, in, in our vector programming that get dinged by the compiler, which otherwise would end up shipping to production and causing all sorts of havoc. Cool. After this intro of, of Rust, um, let's let's get real. Let's get uh, let's talk about how we use it uh, on a couple of projects. So we are going to be talking about vector that Brian was mentioning, and we're going to be talking about the metrics index uh, service that we have uh, internal at Datadog. Uh, so before we deep dive into why Rust and and why. Uh, it's useful for this project. Let's let's give a little bit of an overview of what those projects are about, uh, so you can understand the the constraints of those projects and and why then uh, using Rust was the the right choice. Uh, so let's start by the metrics index, uh, Duarte, the project that you're working on. Yeah. So uh, the metrics index team uh, provides the service to index time series, uh, which is one of the services underpinning this type of graph where we are showing the values of a time series over, over time. So in, in this example, um, we are showing the system.cpu.user metric, uh, filtering it by the service test one tag, and then grouping it by the account tag. And in, in Datadog, um, tags have key and value components. So the data that our service is going to ingest is a set of time series. Uh, which are comprised of a customer ID, a metric name, a handle, a timestamp, and a value. And now we're going to apply a series of transformations over this data. And the first of which is to drop the value uh, because we only care about indexing um, the time series metadata. And uh, this will be the responsibility of a different service to uh, take the metadata, metadata that we're going to return and uh, fetch and display the values in those graphs. Uh, 
Now, this handle that we see here is um, a space efficient way of referring to a set of tags. So if uh, two handles have the same value, then they refer to exactly the same uh, set of tags. So the next transformation that we do is uh, for each handle, expand it into the set of uh, constituent tags. And then we are going to transform that timestamp into uh, a time bucket by reducing uh, precision. And this in turn will allow us to uh, remove uh, duplicate uh, time series metadata so that we are able to um, store and index uh, less data than, than what we ingest. So now that we have this data, we can, we can query it. And um, using the same example query, we are interested in the system CPU user time series. And the first thing we want to do is we want to filter the handles by the service test one uh, tag. So um, the metric, the, the query also has an implicit start and end timestamps. And so we, we make sure that we only return the handles uh, whose time bucket overlaps with the, queries, the query time window. And to do this, we need to have an index that maps each tag to the set of handles in which it appears. So that's the, the filtering step. Now we want to group by the account tag. So for this, uh, we have another index that maps the handle to each set of tags. So we figure out uh, what, what tags occur in each of those handles and uh, group them by uh, the grouping tags. This is going to be the metadata that our service returns that is going to then be used to fetch the time series um, values. Um, so we have uh, some design goals uh, for this service. As I mentioned in the intro, it is the rewrite. Uh, it's not only the language uh, that changed, it's also uh, re-architecture. Um, and as such, we inherited some um, design goals of the previous system, uh, namely reliability, but we've also added to it, uh, namely we want to return five times uh, the amount of handles that we can currently return at lower latencies. And we also want to ingest uh, half a billion time series per second um, per data center. Cool, thank you. Um, what about Vector? But uh, Brian, can you give us an intro of what Vector does? Yeah, so um, Vector is sort of an inside baseball infrastructure tool. Uh, the, the basic idea for Vector is that you have data coming from a variety of places. So um, structured, unstructured, could come from files, uh, could come from TCP sources, could come from syslog, uh, a variety of places we call these sources. Um, you then sort of pump all of this incoming structured or unstructured data, today logs, metrics, in the future traces, through what we call transforms. So a, a transform is something that could be as simple as take a log, parse it, and turn it into a metric, or as complicated as a, a full bore program. Um, those transforms then hook out into syncs. So um, it's pretty common in an infrastructure to have the desire to take logs, parse your logs, turn it into metrics, and then send your metrics to uh, something like Prometheus or Datadog, uh, and then take those original logs and push them into Elasticsearch or S3 or Kafka or something like that. So the idea for Vector is that we have built a tool that runs in your infrastructure that allows you to um, adapt your existing sources of data, transform them, and then push them to kind of wherever you need. The idea is that it, it ultimately ends up being kind of a Swiss Army chainsaw type of thing. Um, it is meant to be as applicable as possible uh, and as trouble-free as possible. So our largest customers um, push quite a bit of data through, uh, through Vector. So 50 terabytes is sort of what we're aware of. We are an open source project. Um, and because you don't necessarily have to ask us to run Vector, we're not totally sure if there are larger users, but these are the ones that we're aware of. Um, the, the sort of design goals that we have for Vector um, that inform all of the implementation that we do and why Vector is written in Rust. Um, 
our, our main goal is to maximize throughput. So you push bytes into vector and uh, we want it to uh, race through uh, without loss and with guarantees that it is actually processed if we say that we've caught it. So all other things considered, uh, we maximize throughput. Because the, the value of vector is, is that it is generally useful for a variety of infrastructure setups and most infrastructures that I've ever seen are bespoke to one degree or another, um, we try and maximize configurability. So that is not to mean that we try to expose sort of internal tweaking values to users, but, but more high level uh, uh, useful uh, things for for end users to not get sort of trapped in a, a uh, swamp of tweaking this little magic value and tweaking that little magic value. And then the other thing that we try and do is to minimize resource consumption. So part of the goal of Vector is to be as trouble-free as possible. And if you give us a fixed amount of CPU and memory, the goal is to use all of that CPU and memory, but no more. Uh, and as much as possible, we release over re release, try and consume less of that resource so that we can push more throughput. Cool. Thanks. Um, if you want, by the way, if you want to, to give a try to vector a very easy way to do that, um, particularly the transformations of, of the data is, is using the course that we have on the learning center. So that's learn.datalog.hq.com and it will spin up a full environment for you, including a data account, et cetera, all the things that you need. Um, so if you want to give it a try, that's a very, very simple, easy way uh, to, to try Vector. Good. So after this intro of, of the projects, let's, let's talk about uh, implementation of those projects and, and why, why Rust. Uh, Duarte, do you want to, to start by talking about uh, the metrics index? Yeah, uh, I do. So um, our implementation goals are very performance centric. So we want uh, our software to be very efficient where uh, every cycle the machine can give us does uh, useful work. We also want to squeeze out every cycle that the hardware can give us by fully utilizing it. And uh, most importantly, we want to have control over um, how those cycles are, are actually spent. Um, so at a high level, our service, uh, service is um, decomposing two independent components. And the first of which is intake, uh, and it reads the time series data from Kafka, applies those transformations I talked about, and then writes the transformed data into a separate um, Kafka topic that's also shared with, with other systems at uh, Datadog. The storage component uh, then uh, reads and indexes uh, this data, making it available for queries. So if we zoom in on uh, the storage component, um, it is composed of what we call interest workers, which are processes that are reading data from Kafka, um, decompressing and interpreting it, and uh, sending them over a set of queues to what we call storage workers which are a set of processes organized in a thread per core uh, architecture, uh, each of which handling a subset of the data uh, that then index them in RocksDB and answer queries. So because we have this um, thread per core architecture, uh, synchronous IO is, is very important. Uh, so we have to make sure we don't block the thread and then we wouldn't be utilizing the hardware like you meant to. Uh, so why, why is Rust um, a very good choice for this system? Well, uh, first and foremost, because it affords us a lot of control, namely over memory management. So we, we, we want to have very low tail emphasis when answering queries. So we don't want garbage collection to be scheduled at the worst possible time. Um, we, uh, like I mentioned, also have um, a thread record architecture. So uh, we need control over how our background asynchronous tasks are scheduled. So for example, if this were written in Go, Go uh, has a scheduler that decides where Go routines, or what CPU Go routines will end up executing. Uh, because we want control uh, over that, we want to make sure that um, asynchronous tasks spawn by a CPU are then executed on the same CPU. Uh, we wrote our own uh, scheduler for this, our own asynchronous runtime. Um, 
They're also in the process of uh, migrating to Glowmail, which is a fully featured thread per car synchronous runtime written at Datadog, um, which is open source and you should check it out, uh, which will then afford us even more control, namely, uh, we'll be able to do IO scheduling. So um, we could have used C++ for this. It also forces a lot of control, but then Rust provides us uh, with safety, um, which is very important to meet our reliable goals and to allow us to sleep well at night so we don't get paged with uh, sec fault because um, we use the variable after freeing it. So uh, Rust is um, amazing here. And finally, um, we rely heavily on open source um, breaks. So um, another reason to choose Rust is its uh, tooling and ecosystem. Um, so we, we use um, Cadence for metrics, Criterion for benchmarks, also Tokyo and uh, our Kafka interact with, with Kafka. Some of these libraries we, we also co-maintain and they all allow us to be uh, much more productive uh, were we to write this demo lot uh, from scratch. Um, but Rust uh, by itself is uh, not enough uh, to allow us to meet all of our uh, implementation goals. So we also employ um, a set of practices um, like writing tailor-made data structures and algorithms, which allow us to take advantage of our very specific uh, use case. We also imply a lot of micro and macro benchmarking and uh, a lot of profiling. For profiling, uh, we rely on Datadog's uh, open source uh, native profiler that allows us to do continuous profiling. So we always have a flame graph available for our service at any given point in time. It also allows us to compare uh, flame graphs for two different versions of our service, which allows us to uh, track uh, and fix uh, potential performance regressions. And having this uh, flame graphs available is also what allows us to uh, do um, very targeted optimizations. Um, and the results uh, so far are very encouraging. Uh, so we were able to uh, reduce uh, query latency um, by 2x at 25% cheaper uh, hardware cost. Uh, keep in mind, we're just starting out. There's still a lot of work left to do. Okay, so basically, what what you were you allowed you you were able to do is to not only reduce the latency but also reduce the the number of VMs that we need to to run this service on. Yeah, exactly. Good, um, very exciting. Uh, Cool. Let's let's move to to vector and vector implementation. Yeah. So for vector implementation, there are a couple of main challenges that we we have uh, as as people working on vector. Um, the first one is that vector has an extremely broad configuration surface. Um, it even includes a, a full full bore programming language. Um, what that means in practice is that it's it's very challenging for us to. Um, understand when a user says something is slow, what that actually means. Um, so we've, we've sort of got a, a, uh, a challenge there that is um, continually needing to be overcome. And the other challenge that we have is that users are the ones that run Vector. So we don't necessarily control the hardware uh, that Vector runs on, or rather we don't constrain the hardware that Vector is supposed to run on. And we don't con control or constrain the operating systems that Vector runs on. So what that means in practice is that um, certain specialization optimizations that we might make in Vector are not necessarily available to us because we would lose that sort of general purpose nature of the tool. Um, so with these challenges in mind and with our design goals in mind, our implementation goals are um, safety. So because we are um, in some sense, externalizing the cost of dealing with operational issues, uh, although we do run Datadog here, uh, uh, we do run Vector here at Datadog as well. Um, we want Vector as much as possible to be fit for purpose, to, to not crash during running. So that means that um, we rely very much on the uh, sort of ownership model, the concurrency uh, safety that we get. Uh, and we try and minimize the amount of unsafe rust that we, we have in the, in the system. So unsafe rust being uh, 
where you just tell the compiler to give you a C-like environment uh, if you need to do sort of low-level pointer munging. Um, the other is maintainability. So as much as possible, we have vector structured in a way where it is modular internally, and you are able to work on a small subset of the project to sort of meet your need. Um, that's an, also important because while there is a paid development team behind Vector, Vector is an open source project that does get open source contributions. And we don't want uh, our potential contributors to have to understand the whole scope of the project before they sort of scratch their itch. Um, debugability is huge. Uh, it is, like I mentioned, a challenge to understand when a user says that such and such thing is slow or not functioning well, what is actually going on? So we spend a lot of time thinking about self metrics, about how structured logging works in the project, um, how we can hook up remotely if, if people are willing to play ball, things like that. Um, and then again, because of our design goals, throughput is king. Uh, all other things being considered equal, we maximize throughput. Uh, and then to do that, uh, we uh, conserve the resources that we're given. So as much as possible, each individual operation should release or release take less time so we can maximize the number of total operations that we're allowed to do at the same amount of time. So how, how do we actually go about doing this? So the, the first thing we sort of do is to lean very hard into the type system. So um, if you haven't used Rust, Rust has a, uh, in addition to the sort of safety guarantees that are made about memory, um, Rust has a pretty elaborate type system. Um, if you've used OCaml or, or SML, it should be familiar, the, the type of guarantees that you get. What this allows us to do is to build components inside a vector that have a certain type interface that plug into one another in a way that don't necessarily require you to understand the internals if you are um, working on a, a restricted part of vector. Um, that also means that we know at compile time that they actually plug together properly which is super useful. Um, type systems don't tell you if your program is actually correct. They just tell you if your program compiles <laughs> consistent with the guarantees that the type system offers. So we focus a lot on randomized testing. So property testing of key components, fuzz testing of um, things that we're suspicious of. Um, the idea there being that a human being that defines inputs for a test will necessarily be biased about the inputs they choose. Um, and if you get a computer to randomly choose inputs to tests, you get a broader surface area of, of search of the possible state space, ideally finding things that crash. Um, the, the next sort of thing that we do, uh, as I mentioned very briefly, is that we have quite a bit of self-instrumentation in the project. So at runtime, we need to know if Vector is functioning well, uh, uh, or you need to know if you are running Vector. And so we have signals that come up out of the program. These signals can be shared with us. They sort of feed back into debugability as well. Um, but the operational side of Vector is something that we focus on quite a bit. Consistent with our goal of maximizing throughput, um, we have invested quite a bit of time into micro and macro benchmarking. So micro benchmarking uh, is, is something that folks are pretty familiar with. So micro benchmarking in Rust is, is pretty commonly done with Criterion. The problem with micro benchmarking is that the micro behavior of a, a subcomponent of your program isn't necessarily indicative of the macro behavior of your program. So we've uh, built a, a, an all up regression testing uh, rig for vector where we build a full vector release and then in a statistically reliable way we are able to tell users on every pull request for every change uh, if their change has um, modified vector performance either up or down and then we have guarantees uh, in the project ci that you never move uh, you never regress throughput um, and then the last thing that we sort of take in vector is to have this sort of short loop repeatable CI. Um, this is something that we also spend quite a bit of time on so that the longer you're waiting for feedback, uh, the sort of worse the results are for the development process. This is a challenge because Rust compile times are not very fast. Um, we have a very broad testing surface area and the benchmarking that we do is CPU intensive. So it's something that we've invested quite a bit of time in. Uh, and all of these are available to our open source contributors as well. So that has been something that we've 
um, we've tried to keep consistent so that it's not just the paid developers that have access to these, these sorts of tools. Um, that has allowed us release over release to um, increase performance uh, in, a, in a way that we can statistically measure. And though, of course, software is always sort of riddled with bugs, um, ideally, we're not adding new ones each time. And we sort of suss out um, pretty complex bugs. So one of our engineers just landed a uh, pretty large change that was pretty elaborately property tested, uh, which I'm, I'm excited about. So we'll, we'll see. We'll see what edge cases those didn't catch, but um, should be fun. Cool, thanks. Uh, yeah, th I I agree that as an external contributor, every time that I contribute to a project, an open source project, when I see that as soon as I sign up PR, I get test results, um, LinkedIn, any anything that can help me get my PR merch in uh, sooner and and more reliable. That's that's always great to see. So, so thanks for, for making that effort. Um, cool. So we are uh, at the end. Uh, so we are going to go for questions. There are already questions coming in. So thanks a lot for that. Uh, remember to use the Q&A button to, to ask your questions. Before we jump into questions, I wanted to, to ask Duarte and Brian their, their rust journey. So how did they start with the, with the language? And also about the future, what they are expecting uh, about the future of Rust. Uh, Duarte, do you want to go first? Yeah, uh, so I'm, I'm a relative newcomer to Rust. Uh, I used uh, 2020's advent of code to learn the language, uh, using it mostly as a normal high-level language. And shortly thereafter, I um, was interviewing for Datadog and I solved uh, the take-home assignment using Rust, already with some performance concerns. And I used that opportunity to learn a sync Rust. Now I've been using the language for over a year. And maybe due to my C++ background, I've spent a lot of that time fighting with the compiler. Um, and I'm still far from being an expert on all aspects of the language, but it's definitely my language of choice, um, even for things uh, that are not systems programming. And uh, what I'm most looking forward uh, in terms of upcoming features, I think are fallible allocations. So instead of panicking when we cannot allocate memory, we'll be able to um, recover from that situation by, for example, uh, doing things like freeing objects from the cache or treating that as a signal to do more aggressive load shedding. And uh, structured concurrency, I'm also uh, looking forward to. Cool, so yeah, you, you can see, you can use advent of code as a way, it's a still far away, but uh, you, can, you can use it as a way to, to learn Rust. Uh, how about Brian, different, different background in your case? Yeah, quite, quite a bit. Um, so I actually started using Rust in the 0607 era. Um, so my background, like I mentioned, is in systems programming. I had um, been working on a very large, high throughput airline program that we started embedding um, C++ bits into to try and improve throughput. And the results were mixed. So if you've never used Erlang, it's a highly concurrent language. And the uh, uh, sort of lack of concurrency guarantees in C++ was a real challenge. So I started sort of looking around for uh, languages that would be suitable for that type of environment. There are some academic languages that make stronger guarantees than Rust do. Um, but Rust is the first language that is that I, I sort of stumbled across that seemed practically useful in the type of low level uh, environment that I was looking for. Um, uh, 07 was a pretty different language from what we have today. Um, but luckily for me, <laughs> it turns out that Rust seemingly is, is actually making its way into production. Um, and so that, that bet paid off. Cool, how about the future? Rust. Oh yeah, right, the future. Um, so the thing that I'm actually looking forward to the most is um, maybe very inside baseball. So I am looking forward to stable specialization. So the idea is that in Rust, you have these generic types that are defined over a, um, a type T that has some constraints on it. I am very interested in a thing called specialization where you have your generic type and then for a concrete type, you can have a different implementation. So a good example would be a hash map where you have a generic K 
for key and V for value. Uh, if you have a hash map where the K is a byte, you no longer need to do hashing or anything like that. You just need an array <laughs> of a certain size. Um, that uh, unlocks a lot of interesting uh, performance optimizations that I would like to, to um, be able to do. But unfortunately, specialization is one of those things that has sort of um, been unsound for a while. So meaning that it exposes kind of a hole in the type system or a problem that is not uh, necessarily fixable uh, or not fixable in the way that specialization was defined. Um, I have seen other approaches to it, but I don't know that anyone is working on it. And uh, I have not gone on sabbatical to poke at it. So <laughs> we'll, we'll see. Who knows? Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. So if you're interested in, in this type of projects, uh, we are hiring across the board. So you can go to our career spread at thedoghq.com slash careers. Also, if you want to have a look to some of the open source projects that uh, we maintain at Datadog, Greeting in Rust, I left there uh, some links to, to Vector, Glomio, and, and the common libraries for the profilers. Those are written in Rust, so have a look to those as well. And let's go for questions. So we already have uh, quite a bit, so thanks a lot for everybody who's posting their questions. First question says, from what I understood from Brian's and Duarte's introduction to the Rust language, uh, common C pointer oper operations would be challenging to reproduce in Rust. How do you deal with data structures and algorithms that require pointer-like references? Yeah, there, there's actually a follow-up question um, asking about unsafe, um, since I, I, I mentioned that. So I'll, I'll, I'll lump those two together and, and please ask a follow-up question if I don't. Um, sort of get them. So C style pointer operations are less commonly needed in Rust than, than you would expect. Um, the, the type of pointer munging that you, you need to do in C is not um, as desirable. It sort of fights against the compiler. Um, however, it is possible that you, you have a structure that requires that, or uh, you have to interact with a C library that sort of requires that. So there is the unsafe escape hatch where you tell the Rust compiler for this block of code, um, don't apply the sort of memory safe guarantees. To the question about using um, unsafe in uh, highly concurrent areas, you, you wouldn't, you don't, <laughs> don't do that. Le lean onto the type system. So if you are, if you are doing um, the kind of like unsafe or C style concurrency in, in Rust, you might consider if um, you have sort of misunderstood what is available to you in the language. So there are smart pointer types, if you're familiar with the C++ approach, that are high performance, low cost, low cost or zero cost, if the compiler can prove that they are zero cost, um, that you would use instead. So I know, I know Duarte's work has unsafe in it where Vector does not. Um, but we run in slightly different environments. We have different uh, uh, optimization goals. Good. Uh, Duarte, if, if you want to add anything there. Yeah. Um, in, in, in Rust, one, one, one challenging thing you can try to do is to implement a doubly linked list, meaning that uh, a node will have two owners, the previous one and, and the next one which isn't really allowed in, in Rust. Um, so what you would use in other languages would be a, a reference. And the same thing if you have uh, data in a data structure that you want to index in another data structure, uh, you would naturally use a reference for this in other languages. Because uh, Rust makes uh, it impossible to have two owners for the same variable. And if you use references, you can get into lifetime arguments with the compiler. What's commonly done is that you'll sometimes uh, refer to data by their indices or IDs and uh, instead of references, which is just another way to have that in direction. Um, and then just to clarify, we don't really use unsafe in a threading context. We mostly use unsafe like when we don't wanna do bounce checking because we already checked for that um, and stuff like that. Good. Um, let's let's move to, to Sophia and question. 
which I think is, is very interesting for, for teams who are uh, thinking about moving some of their services to, to Rust. Uh, can you talk about the cost of onboarding new services using Rust language in the engineering group, especially when most of your stack already use Go or something else, especially in terms of code instrumentation, distributed tracing, etc.? Yeah, so um, largely um, the, the new uh, Rust services integrated very well with uh, the existing infrastructure at, at Datadog. One example of that is um, the, the continuous profiler. Uh, for other things like uh, tracing and, and metrics, we, we did have to write uh, some um, custom code, but um, we also have the goal of um, making REST more widespread within the organization. So it's work that will have to be done anyway. And yeah, overall, um, it's been fairly simple. Even with regards to onboarding engineers, even though REST has a steep learning curve um, by using the compiler as a guide and, and teammates as a guide, it's, it's, I think it's been um, the hill that's been easy to climb. Yeah, for, for, for newcomers, Sam has a, a kind of related questions. Uh, it's uh, for those who have little to no experience with Rust, uh, maybe they have done a small side project or two, what advice would you, would you give them to become competent enough to get hired working on larger complex projects like Vector or the Metrics Index? Yeah, I, I can cover that. Um, so we've definitely hired people under the Vector project that do not have production Rust experience and um, sort of train them up. So I think the, the best advice that I've got, and keep in mind because I've been fiddling with Rust for so long, my advice is maybe not as, <laughs> as useful. Um, my, my advice would be, you know, get basic competency and then try and, and get basic competency and have a good track record already and try and get hired into a team that would be willing to mentor you. So it's, it, and that that's true, I think, for almost any programming language where there is sort of that, that skill gap between the sort of academic knowledge you get from reading and, and doing small projects and the like actual production uh, experience. So I don't know that Rust is terribly different in that regard. Good. Um... So another question from the audience, David is asking, Rust has a reputation for slow compile times. What has been your experience and do you have some tips to help with that? Uh, yes, I get a faster computer. <laughs> um, it, it, to be serious, I mean, that is partially a serious answer. Um, it, it is a real challenge um, for large Rust projects. Vector particularly has um, pretty long compile times. And yeah, we just have to get uh, short, uh, short trying to contribute uh, improvements to the compiler. Um, we just have to get faster machines. That's always a, a good solution. <laughs> um, okay, going back to, uh, so we still have some minutes left. So if you have more questions, please uh, to continue posting those questions. Um, some question about the implementation of the of the metrics index system. Uh, have RocksDB or Kafka been bottlenecks for the system? And since you mentioned that some of the libraries and, and algorithms are in house, are you planning to uh, replace any of, of those um, of those systems? Uh, yes, good question. Uh, so Kafka has not been a bottleneck, but yes, RocksDB uh, has been one, and we do have plans to. Uh, start replacing uh, RocksDB um, in a piecemeal fashion. I have plans to start by replacing uh, an AMP table with a custom one that's tailored to, to, to our, our data. And yeah, eventually the goal is to have uh, our own storage layer so we can, um, we, we can implement it, um, taking advantage of all the idiosyncrasies of our use case for, for uh, additional performance gains. Cool. Thank you. Uh, so we don't have more questions from the audience, uh, but we have three minutes left. Uh, so 
I, I have a couple of questions that I, that I had prepared in case uh, we didn't have questions, um, but I wanted to ask them anyway. So um, one, one thing that I, that I wanted to, to ask you, Duarte, is that uh, you've shown the results of the re-implementation in Rust uh, of the metric index, uh, the, the lower uh, latency, the, the lower cost as well. Um, do you think that those were mainly driven by, by changing from Go to, to Rust or are they just because uh, there are better knowledge about the system and, and the re-architecture of the system was what uh, made those gains? Uh, it's, it's hard to say, but I think uh, most games have been accomplished by the re-architecture. Um, there, there's, um, there, there are a lot of games that, that you can have in terms of performance, but just by changing how um, you, you approach your system. So for example, having a thread per core architecture means while we still have concurrency, we don't have data races, so we don't have to use um, synchronization mechanisms that employ atomics and that carry um, um, a runtime cost. Yeah, or we, we didn't even incur the cost of caching validation between CPUs. Um, but there are definitely uh, loss of gains that were because of Rust. Just the fact that it doesn't do garbage collection means we can have much lower tail latencies. And then there are the more intangible gains like sleeping well at night, which I really value. Uh, those are very, very important gains, indeed. Um, uh, so the, the, the last question. Uh, so I wanted to um, contribute to an open source project, particularly if it's big, like, like Vector can be daunting. Uh, if after seeing this talk, someone has decided to give it a try and see if they can contribute to, to Vector, um, Brian, would you recommend people to start with? Yeah, um, I think for contributing specifically to Vector, it's it's valuable if you have a particular problem that you would like to like to resolve. Um, so because we're kind of finicky about throughput, um, and we might have a, a couple loops on feedback, if you have a a concrete thing that you want to get into Vector, like you want the Redis source to uh, do streaming or or something like that. Um, you'll have more incentive, I think, to to go through the go through the process. Um, however, if you would like to indirectly contribute to Vector, um, you can always pick one of our our dependencies and see if you can speed it up. Uh, that some of those are relatively small and do have kind of low hanging fruit in them um, that we don't necessarily uh, have the time to poke at because of higher level structural changes in vector. So the um, we have a lot of dependencies, so you can sort of take a peek at what we've got. But overall, I think most of the dependencies that we've picked for vector have um, upstream communities that are, are easy to work with. So uh, hi highly recommended. That's a very great advice. Sometimes uh, you're interested in a project and the best way to, to help is, is helping the, the projects around it as well. Um, so we are uh, at time, so thanks very much. As we said, uh, this is being recorded, so as soon as it get, gets published, it will get published in, in YouTube, so feel free to distribute it to your colleagues who might be interested on the talk as well. Thanks a lot, Brian and Duarte, for sharing, sharing your knowledge, and thanks everyone for, for coming to, to this session and and ask those questions because uh, having those um, makes it a lot more fun. So thanks very much and we'll see you on the next one.